Okay, we are back. So all of you, uh, there was a, we were discussing the Turner syndrome question and uh, I think it got disconnected. So all of you, what test is not done in Turner syndrome, especially in a mosaic child? So remember that there are many complications of Turner syndrome and uh, glucose tolerance test should be done because they are at risk of metabolic syndrome and diabetes. We discussed in all of our classes that echocardiography should be done in all of these patients because they are at risk of bicuspid aortic valve, coarctation of aorta. Audiometry should be done because Turner syndrome are at risk of both conductive deafness as well as sensory neural deafness. So audiometry should also be done. Now remember, ANA has no role in Turner syndrome. Turners are at risk of autoimmune disorders like thyroiditis. So thyroid function test should be done. But remember, ANA is especially useful in Klinefelter syndrome. Okay, so Klinefelter syndrome are at risk of rheumatoid arthritis and SLE. So ANA is important for Klinefelter syndrome, not for Turner syndrome. Now there was a question on live vaccines, whether they can be given in which disorder and not. Now remember, the first three disorders mentioned here, the DGORS, the Viscott, Eldritch and Ataxia Telangiectasia, these disorders have combined immunodeficiency. So both T cell and B cell immunodeficiency are seen in all of these three disorders. So DGORS, Viscott, Eldritch and I would like to add here that ataxia telangiectasia combined immunodeficiency T cell and IgA is deficient, IgG is deficient, IgG2 is deficient. So live vaccines are contraindicated in these disorders. Now you should also know that chronic granulomatous disease which is a phagocytic defect. Now in this disorder also live bacterial vaccines are contraindicated. However, in complement factor deficiencies, remember, in fact, vaccines are indicated. These children are at risk of capsulated organisms. So remember, vaccines are especially indicated in these syndromes. Okay, especially the pneumococcal H influenza and Neisseria. Now, red syndrome, we discuss in all of our classes very commonly. And they asked about the recently approved FDA drug for Rett syndrome. And remember that this was a common question because Rett syndrome, you have to know about everything about Rett's. So trophinitide has been approved by the US FDA. This oral suspension is approved for two years or old children. It's a synthetic analog of Ig1. So it's a synthetic analog of insulin like growth factor 1 peptide and it is available now for the red syndrome children another question now i'm asking this question because since uh, i'm a nephrologist and i deal with plasma pheresis in patients of children like children adults and i discuss about plasma pheresis of hemolytic uremic syndrome in classes now ttp is a penta i told you hus is a triad now, in addition to this, TTP has two more problems, fever and neurological symptoms, fever and neurological symptoms. And I'm discussing this because this is one of my favorite topic and one of my favorite picture. Adam TS13 is an enzyme which cleaves the von Willebrand factor. Now, if there is a deficiency or an antibody to Adam TS13, if there is a deficiency or antibody, remember, in our body we get big multimers of von Willebrand factor, platelet gets adhered to the children in their vessels. So these patients have thrombus in their multiple organs. So remember, plasma pheresis in TTP removes the antibody to RMTS and also the new plasma gives the new RMTS. Okay, so both of these are important. Okay, remember this. So plasma pheresis does both in cases of TTP. Now we always discuss about meconium stain liquor in all of your classes and I have already told you in multiple classes that you know now we don't, we don't go for 
intrapartum suction. It has been abandoned since last one decade. We don't do intrapartum suction during labor. Number one. So now the new guidelines and I discussed this is one of my picture from the back to basics recorded lectures and we discuss in all of our lectures that you need to look at whether the baby is vigorous or not. Vigorous means the tone of the baby is good, respiratory effort of the baby is good and heart rate is more than 100 per minute. So if the baby is vigorous, you may go for a gentle suction only. That's it. But if the baby is not vigorous, you go for positive pressure ventilation. So this question, I think, was a multiple options correct question. All of you correct me if I'm wrong. So you may go for a gentle suction in a vigorous child. In a non-vigorous child, you go for positive pressure ventilation. Remember, intrapartum suction is gone. We don't do that anymore. And if a baby is not vigorous, we don't do tracheal suctioning also now. In the last American Heart Association guideline, intratracheal suction was taken out. So we just manage this baby like a routine baby with the routine indications of resuscitation. Now a, a simple question on CFTR cystic fibrosis I tell you in each and every class of mine I take a lecture on almost half an hour on cystic fibrosis you should know everything about the life cycle of cystic fibrosis so of course uh, it is a problem of the CFTR gene which codes for the chloride channel and this is again a snapshot from my back to basics lecture on cystic fibrosis and I can tell you this is a very common topic will definitely come in your exam okay so remember it's chloride channel, no doubt about this, no price for guessing this, it's a very simple question. Let's go further. A question on NADA's minor criteria for diagnosing congenital heart disorders. So there was a question on NADA's criteria and we discuss whenever we talk about congenital heart disorders, this is how I start. And this is in all of your notes, we told you that the minor criteria of NADAs are five. So to call a baby has congenital heart disease, you need to have one major or two minor criteria. And the minor criteria are systolic murmur less than grade three, abnormal second heart sound, abnormal ECG, abnormal X-ray, abnormal blood pressure. So if you look back to this question, abnormal second heart sound, abnormal blood pressure are both minor NADAS criteria to call it as a congenital heart disease. Remember, we need one major or two minor criteria to call it as a heart disease. Let's go further. Every exam, every class, we tell you about Kawasaki disease. So there was a typical question on Kawasaki disease, no prizes for you know guessing this. And many students told me that there were a lot of pictures in this question. A child with conjunctival inflammation was there. Correct me if I'm wrong. Strawberry tongue was there. Descommission was there. And in fact, the examiners had also told you the answer also in this question by making it in brackets. Now, every lecture of yours of pediatrics has Kawasaki disease. And we have told you that IVIG reduces the risk of coronary artery aneurysms to 4 to 6 percent. We have to give IVIG during the acute phase of Kawasaki disease along with high dose aspirin. So of course all of you you had to do this correctly. The answer of this question is IVIG 2 grams per kg during the acute phase within the first 10 days of illness you are supposed to give IVIG in Kawasaki disease along with high dose aspirin. But IVIG is a must because it reduces the risk of aneurysms and also reduces the complications, the cardiovascular complications of Kawasaki disease. We told you all of this in your routine classes. There was a question on a pedigree. Now in this pedigree, parents are affected 
children are also affected so if all generations are affected it's dominant okay males and females are equally affected this is autosomal so again uh, if you go back to our back to basics or any lecture now some students say one of the option was pseudo dominance now what is pseudo dominance i'll just spend a minute on pseudo dominance pseudo dominance means that actually the inheritance is recessive but it looks like dominant okay it actually means the inheritance is recessive but looks like a dominant how see here this female was homozygous okay recessive disorder she was homozygous she married a carrier male so now children are affected almost 50% chance that children will be affected so if a homozygous partner in autosomal recessive marries a heterozygous carrier then again the 50% children are involved so it may look like dominant but this is called pseudo dominance okay so coming back to the question the question was it was autosomal dominant a typical pedigree it was not pseudo dominance okay it was not incomplete penetrance because in incomplete penetrance you have the disease but you are not expressing it but here everyone is expressing it like a typical autosomal dominant pedigree so that was all about the questions of pediatrics asked in your exams and i also gave you references from the current issue of the op gai textbook the current issue of the nelson textbook guys uh, do feel free to tag me on any of these social media platform i am open to all the queries all the suggestions if you feel any of these options were not asked exactly do let me know i have thoroughly checked with most of the students and these are the most authentic options which came in your exam do let me know if you have any queries and here's uh, siddharth sethi wishing you all the best on behalf of dams family Good evening.